Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. It gives you everything you need in one place for free, which you can use right from your phone or computer. Creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great. They'll even distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. You can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Also, welcome back to another episode of It Is What It Is podcast. I am your host, Cody Kelly. Thank you for tuning in. Look, if you want to keep seeing amazing content, you know what you have to do. Subscribe to the link below. That's where all the cool stuff is happening on the YouTube page, on Instagram. Follow me. I have an amazing episode with some amazing guests. And yes, this is live. So if I feel a question is pertinent, I will address it. Uh, Politics Today. We just had an inauguration, right? A lot has been going on. So I asked these just three amazing individuals to be on the show just to kind of speak about what's currently occurring (laughs) and really express their opinion. So I'm allow them to introduce themselves, starting with none other than the attorney, Amanda Perkins, Esquire. (laughs) Hi, um, I'm Amanda Mancata Perkins. Thanks so much, Cody, for having me back on your podcast. I always have a very good time when I'm here. Um, and yeah, I, I'm an attorney, run a um, business consulting firm. I'm also a, um, a lecturer at my alma mater, my law school, DePaul Law. Um, I don't have much to say. I'm just excited to be here, add some, some of my perspective regarding what's going on. Um, and I look forward to the discussion tonight. Awesome. Derek, if you can introduce yourself. Uh, Derek Scott, uh, and in the great state of Michigan and uh, work in real estate, uh, trained as an architect, urban planner, uh, run a real estate development company on the east side of Detroit, uh, doing some great work in the city uh, and just excited to be a part of the conversation. And he's also running for his uh, trustee board of the Church of God of Christ. Vote Derek. I have not given my official endorsement to anybody but Derek. So Derek has my endorsement. I got to make sure I'm registered on ARC. I know I am. I just want to make sure my vote counts. And none other than Malik, my friend, my brother, if you can introduce yourself. Yeah, um, Malik Abdul, thanks again for having me here. I'm a a political commentator and GOP strategist based here in Washington, D.C. You know, I think this is the year for you, Cody, you know. (laughs) I want to I want to see you on CNN and all of the other networks <laughs> and get people to fund your what you're doing. But I really think this is great what you're doing, providing this platform. So I'm happy to be here. Appreciate it. Look, if CNN is hiring, give me a call, you know, because they they need some fresh faces and perspectives. I'm not wearing a shirt and tie. This is going to be my look every day, chest showing. That's what I feel. He, he's bringing back the 90s. That's yes. it. Bring back the chest. <laughs> hey, look, let's get into it. So inauguration was yesterday. It was a long event. A lot of stuff happened. But there were some notable moments. Uh, you know, there was three prayers, which I appreciated. It felt like church service. I was about to, you know, send my offering in. They just never told me where to give it. Uh, but I'm going to read some of these quotes that stood out to me. President Biden said the dream of justice for all will not be deferred any longer. Speaking of unity, it sounds like a foolish fantasy. Without unity, there is no peace, only bitterness and outrage. Disagreement does not lead to disunion. So I'm going to start with you, Malik. What was your thoughts on the inauguration? Well, believe it or not, I actually did not watch it. Um, This is actually the first time probably, I think, since 2000 that I haven't attended an inauguration. Uh, But I haven't watched any news since, I think, maybe November 5th. Um, And this is someone where I OD'd on news Just I probably averaged about at least seven hours, seven to eight hours of news every single day for years. And so uh, yesterday was actually different for me. So I decompressed in a way, but it's a little different because so much of it was really virtual anyway. Anyone who wanted to go to the inauguration, you pretty much had to be connected with someone. And then with COVID and obviously with my candidate losing, it was just a different um, type of inauguration. The entire field in the city was different. Um, I was down there today and everything is still gated up. I had to do a media hit earlier. And so it was just, a, it wasn't a normal 
um, inauguration. And I understand that we actually have, you know, uh, we're not in normal times. But I think for the most part, a lot of people are happy now that Trump is out of office. And even though I disagree with him, you know, on a number of things, obviously, I wish he were still president, but understand that Trump couldn't get out of his own way. And so for that reason, he's not president. But I'm, you know, mm. I'm, I'm, what I'm hoping is that black people, us, that right. we do something different than what we did when Obama was in office and that we actually start to demand things of our federal government. I'm skeptical that is going to happen because Kamala will be the nominee in 2024. I'm skeptical that we're going to really shake up that tree, but we'll see. What did you think of uh, Pence staying? Pence actually showed up. Well, it, it, this isn't surprising. Pence is not anyone who he hasn't been since he's been in office and even before that. Pence is mild mannered, he's respectful. He doesn't, you know, engage in a lot of the nastiness. You know, people can say he's a whatever, a racist or whatever, but he is a likable guy. And he's always been a likable guy in the same way George Bush. You know, a lot of people didn't like George Bush, but George Bush is a likable guy. Trump is not a likable guy. That's true. That's true. I actually, I actually like George Bush post-presidency, not intro. Bush. Of course. Right. 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 <laughs> This is a cool guy. Attorney Perkins, uh, thoughts on the inauguration? Yeah, um, I think for the first time, a lot of people could um, exhale and breathe. Um, and that was yesterday for, for a lot of people, and especially for me as well, just to wake up and go, Trump is not president anymore. Can we just say hallelujah for that? Um, and, and so it brought a sense of relief um, I feel like a lot of us have been holding our breaths for four years, maybe five, um, if you count the campaigning that went on. Um, the inauguration was very, to me, in a way, it was sort of somber because it was, as Malik said, not it was unlike any other inauguration um, in light of the, the fact that we're still in a, a global pandemic um, and things are still shut down. But even more than that um, is the chaos um, that happened at that um, location at the Capitol not too long before the inauguration happened. And so for a lot of people, you're on edge, you're wondering, is the other shoe going to drop? Um, and just to be able to see that everything went off kind of, you know, um, peacefully was very great to see. Um, I'm thankful that Biden didn't stroke um, language of divide or division during um, his inauguration. In fact, everyone that got up there to speak spoke about unity, spoke about peace, spoke about moving forward. Um, and we need that right now. We need to hear something about hope because if there is anything that we need to hold on to, it is hope. It is hope in the future. It is hope in overcoming. Um, and I think we saw a lot of that. I, I just want to kind of highlight the, the, um, the poet, the laureate, the youngest woman there, the youngest poet, I'm sorry, there. Um, she did a wonderful job. I believe her, her name is Amanda Gorman. Yeah. Um, shout out to my Amandas, we're taking over. Um, she did a wonderful, wonderful job. And she just spoke to you in pain. Is that your dog, Malik? Yeah, yes, you're good. <laughs> he's, he's, he doesn't like what I'm saying, it's okay. Um, <laughs> but spoke, spoke to the pain spoke to the um, the obstacles that still stand in our way, um, but then also spoke to what's to come, what we need to do. And one thing that Malik mentioned that I, I think, I, you know, I'm in total agreement with is we have to be forward looking um, just because we've elected a new administration does not mean that um, we should take for granted the things that we need to happen, right? Yeah. And that's for all of the communities. That's especially, I speak for, you know, I speak with, with what I know, being a Black Latina and things that are prevalent to my communities, but um, for, for all of us, right? I do not, I do not take for granted that we still have a lot of work to do. I do not um, give, I'm not giving any benefits of the doubt for this administration that they're just gonna magically do everything. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. Um, if there's anything that I take away from this inauguration and what Joe Biden said, it is that it's going to take all of us. And I hope that people wake up and realize that 
there is no savior in this situation in terms of government apart from Jesus, but that's my own, you know, that's my thing. Um, but there's no savior in terms of a government. You have to be involved. And then we, we've seen what happens when you stand idly by expecting something to, to land in your lap. Um, and it doesn't. Right. And so I hope that what we do with this administration is turn up the heat um, a lot more so that we can see the progress that we need to see um, in terms of economic progress, health care, education and so much more. Um, and I think we'll start to see that if, if, if we haven't learned that from what we see in Stacey Abrams and how she's taking the hammer to the nail in Georgia, I hope we start to open our eyes and, and, and do that more. Awesome. Derek, uh, inauguration, a lot happened. Um, definitely a message of unity, um, uh, uh, solidarity moving forward. Um, sometimes, um, uh, when there's great rhetoric, there can be terrible follow through. And sometimes when there isn't necessarily good rhetoric, there's great implementation, right? Uh, and you understand this as a leader and as a person of faith, as a leader in faith, as a preacher, you know, there's this church service, right? There's the high mountaintop and then there's Monday through Saturday. What does Monday through Saturday look like now? You know, now that we have a new, we have a new pastor. Now that we have a new president, what, what is going to go on yeah. post inauguration? <laughs> Yeah, so I think, you know, now that the inaugural Holy Convocation is over and, and folks are, are done with the the pomp and circumstance and, you know, we, we got we got the really great rhetoric uh, yesterday. I think Malik and Amanda just highlighted that we heard all the things that uh, we we were not used to hearing over the last four years that sounded very presidential, that really rallied people towards unity uh, and moving things forward. And I think one of the things Amanda pointed out is just one of the things that I'm, I'm sort of concerned about is that uh, all the people who sort of breathed a sigh of relief, I'm hoping that 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 breathing was really to catch their breath so that we could keep the same energy that we used in and sort of uh, holding the last uh, administration accountable and the same energy we used with sort of being very critical of a lot of policies that we saw coming out of the, uh, D.C., that we keep that same energy. Uh, to make sure that things are moving forward over the next uh, four years and, and frankly, over the next hundred days. I think one of the things that I saw yesterday that was, um, I won't call it astounding because I, I think I expected it. it wasn't a surprise, but I think uh, I kind of skated under the radar because so many people were just happy that and relieved that uh, things were going to get quote unquote fixed. And it's the fact that Biden signed 17 executive orders on his very first day in office. Right. Now, Donald Trump signed 24 in his first 100 days in office, 24 executive orders in his first 100 days. And we were very critical of a president that ruled by executive order. I mean, folks were very, very critical that uh, this was a president that was going to be very uh, dictatorial, uh, not look for bipartisan uh, sort of support to get things done. And so I think while yesterday of those 17 executive orders, and this isn't me uh, sort of lending my uh, sort of uh, support in one way or the other, or whether or not I thought they were warranted or not warranted. It's more just pointing out the fact that he signed 17 executive orders yesterday. And that was an example that he was not only going to come in and try to immediately fix some things, but that over the next hundred days, I think this administration has something to prove uh, because the, the, the midterms are coming up in two years and really election season starts in a hundred days for those midterms. And so I think there's a lot of things that they're going to have to get off the ground uh, today and start moving on that as much of the rhetoric we heard about building bipartisan support and having all of this unity, some of this stuff may not happen exactly the way that it's being uh, stated over the pulpit, so to speak. And so I think it's incumbent upon uh, the folks that are sitting in the pews out in, you know, in the country, the folks that are across America to not only continue to hold this administration to the fire, but really participate in local politics, local uh, policy. And then think about some of these things that are getting ready to come down uh, out of D.C., even uh, as we think about some of the pandemic uh, uh, relief that will come in this next wave. Like, how do we make sure that folks are getting the resources that they need and that it's not just simply 
uh, we're ruling by executive order, but that it really is uh, everybody contributing and, and voicing uh, the concerns. Awesome. Malik, let me go here. Um, he started off with one Senate confirmation. Most presidents, they said they average around four to seven, right? Um, and he's, Biden has really put, President Biden has really put an emphasis on COVID relief. I was watching his press conference today. Uh, you have the 100 days, you know, mask uh, wearing in federal buildings he can enforce by law. And then he's asking for obvious support, which I really believe is needed. But what specifically, you know, he enacted FEMA. I think the biggest thing out of the executive orders was the Executive Action for Defense Production Act uh, and enacting FEMA, right, to basically set up uh, these kind of military communities uh, so that the vaccine could be administered, right, administered. So uh, what's the next step? Like, how do we take this action, right, and really get and really yield some positive results? You're muted. Oh, I, you got, you got, you're good now. I'm all right. Um, yeah, I, I actually, yeah, it's great to, you know, I think it's a good thing to set up the, you know, vaccination centers and things like that. But I've always believed that the federal government actually has a limited role in, um, I won't say a lot of this, but in, they have a more limited role than what people suggested. And I think that what we're seeing now, even the things that if you listen to Biden, the things that he's actually talking about, a federal mask mandate, yeah. I, I'm not exactly sure what that is. Well, on federal lands or properties or whatever, mm -hmm. I, I do know that in any government building, and maybe because I'm in D.C. all the time, but you can't go into any building in D.C. without a mask on. And I think that's the case across the federal government. But but like so if there are going to be changes, so we'll see things like that. There won't be any just massive, um, you know, substantive change that can really be felt on the ground. I don't believe that in part because most of the people who will be working on these sort of policies are career professionals in government. They're not people, the government isn't just made up of political appointees. The people who actually do the work are those who've been in these, these um, agencies for 20 or so years. So as far as COVID is concerned, I don't think it is not that we don't have the answer. Biden may do some things different than what Trump did, but you have to consider where we are, where we were then, as opposed to where we are now. Biden realized, even though he talked about that during the campaign, Biden realized this whole thing that I'm going to do this nationwide mass mandate, which is what a lot of people were saying that Trump should have implemented a nationwide mass mandate. Well, Biden sees now, well, you can't do that. And so I think that there's going to be a realization that the government, unfortunately, has a limited, a more limited role than what people otherwise believe. But I do know that we're going to get out of this because we are indeed the greatest country in the world. We're going to get out of this, but it may take us a little time. Awesome. Attorney Perkins, you talked about uh, solidarity, building that message of unity, mm -hmm. right? Um, how do you do that uh, politically? Uh, like Derek mentioned, 17 in the first day. Um, so that's a bold directive. And a lot of it was reversal, uh, reversing what was previously done. Uh, but that's still a bold move, right? So you've already kind of said, you know, where you stand. How do you really build that bridge and build cohesion in the Senate? Uh, now you have a new majority leader in Chuck Schumer, right? Mm -hmm. How do you build that bridge going forward? Yeah, and I... I Thank you for the question and I'll answer that. I just want to kind of trail back a little bit to something Derek said and then also something that Malik said. Um, one, yes, yeah, 17 executive orders. Um, that That is a lot. That's um, more than any modern day president that I can even think of. Um, and I would encourage people to go and actually read what those executive orders are about. The number seems a little alarming, but frankly, if you go and read what those executive orders are about, you're absolutely right. They're a rollback on a lot of executive action that Trump took during office and some things that we needed to happen, need to have happened immediately. Um, whether you agree with it or not, I suppose, um, such as rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, right, and making sure that we extend federal moratoriums on um, evictions and we also extend 
payment or um, payment and interest rates on the student loans. Like some of this stuff is actually immediate action that needs to happen because we are in unprecedented times and with the COVID relief, right? And for DACA uh, recipients. So I would encourage people before you get alarmed by the number of executive orders that you hear, go read the summary about what these executive orders really are, because a lot of them are, again, undoing actions and not necessarily just mandating things to happen. Another thing I wanted to mention is about the whole um, the mask mandate. I kind of want to put some context behind that factually. The mask mandate is for federal departments and agencies. And as um, Malik said, those spaces so anyone entering into those federally um, governed spaces will have to wear masks. In terms of a national mandate, that is not legally possible. The federal government cannot mandate states to um, require their citizens to wear masks. Only states can do that. He has encouraged a pledge for Americans to wear masks for the next 100 days. That is obviously a suggestion. It is not a mandate. So I don't want people to hear the word mandate and think that they're being told that they have to wear a mask if they're a private person. You do not. You do have to feder follow your state laws. But from a federal perspective, um, Biden cannot institute a national mandate. Now, he could, in theory, federally, they could, um, you know, condition funds and things like that to states to require um, people to wear masks, right? But so far, we haven't heard any talk like that, and I doubt that that kind of talk would happen. So I just wanted to clear the air about those those several things. Um, how do we how do we build cohesion and how do we build unity? So Biden has said that a lot of the things that he wants to get done is going to have to go through the Senate. Frankly, there's only so much that Biden or any president can do through executive action. But let me also put some factual context behind this too. President Obama was one of the first presidents that really yielded a lot of power through executive action. And he took that route because he was constantly block it, blocked in the Congress, okay, especially by the Senate. So I want people to understand that too. Um, it's become more of a trend now to use executive authority. Trump did it, and now we see Biden doing it as well. However, there is still a limit that, that Biden can do through executive action. A lot of that will have to take place through Congress. So what should we really be thinking about when it comes to unity is how can we get things, how can we get them to play ball in Congress? Because as you said, the majority has now shifted to the Democrats in, um, in the Senate. It's a slim majority, but it's a majority nonetheless. And so Democrats in some ways are thinking, how can we pass legislation that only requires a simple majority instead of having to have 60 of the votes in the Senate, right? If they do that, then that's a form of not really wanting to play ball or having to play ball with the other side, okay? Let's be mindful. Republicans have done that for a very long time since they've had power. Is that the right action to take? Not necessarily, not from my book. I think the best course of action is that bipartisanship and trying to get everybody to meet in the middle, right? However, this is a conversation that we really need to start thinking about when it comes to our senators, because there's a chance that a lot of things will be passed without having Republican input. But that is not the right course of action to take, because at the end of the day, Republicans still have constituents that they're worried about. Right. And they need to be able to advocate for those constituents as well. So I am hoping that what we can do is get to a place where we can talk about what our constituents need across the aisle and have an opportunity to pass bills by, on a bipartisan basis. If that doesn't happen, and it's going to require both both sides, right? This is not a, well, Democrats have to do this or Republicans have to do that. It is a both sides need to come to the table and stop wielding the biggest stick. Um, and, and frankly, I think <laughs> that requires a lesson about being collaborative and, and playing nicely in the playground that we got when we were in elementary school. Um, so, you know, I, that, that's just my, my, my take on it. Legally, there's a chance that Democrats can do what they want. Um, but is that the right course of action? It won't send the right message in terms of unity. Awesome. Well said, well said. 
Uh, let's piggyback on that. Yielding the biggest stick. Derek, so this is the last question I have because I know I've asked you guys to be on every 30 minutes, and this is for each one of you. Economically, what needs to happen first? There's like a list, right? If you want direct cash payments, 2000 President Biden comes back. We've already got 600, 1400 now. You know, uh, what is what needs to what needs to happen first, Derek? So first of all, I feel so inadequate after hearing Amanda so eloquently lay out her argument. So I'm I'm going to uh, digress and not act like the um, the expert on this. But I think there's a few a few things that I think, at least to me, are important. Um, and not just to me, but I think there's questions that people are asking. So one of those questions is what's going to happen with stu- student loan relief, right? What what is the number? Is it ten thousand? Is it fifty thousand? Is it uh, based on your income cap? And what type of relief are student loan borrowers going to see there? And what type of impact is that going to have on uh, the economy moving forward and people's ability to sort of get from under student loan debt and to have larger capacity to borrow, get more capital into the market, uh, you know, buy a house if you're a student that's you know under you know so much debt that you aren't even considering those type of things as options. So I think that that's going to be a big piece. I think this tax reform, I'm interested in seeing, you know, what sticks from what was thrown out in in the Biden policy uh, as far as things like, you know, this is one of those times where I'm actually happy uh, about one of the the pieces that's in there because um, I have seven kids and, you know, folks usually laugh at the fact that I have so many children. Uh, but the idea of the child tax credit increasing a thousand dollars a child sounds really good to me. Um, and so I think there are there are things like that that's going to provide some relief for some middle income families. Um, sort of the the, the state tax cap uh, on state property taxes and sales taxes that ten thousand dollar cap does that go away uh, and give uh, borrowers or earners the the opportunity to sort of claim more deductions? Uh, I think all of these things uh, that that happen within the tax reform are going to be in, in really important in sort of catalyzing uh, the the economy. I don't think the tax reform is going to happen fast enough though. Um, I'm also interested in seeing, you know, sort of what happens with all the appointments at the Treasury and sort of what happens with rates uh, from the from that perspective. Does does the market still stay uh, where it is right now, where it's still a very favorable lending market? Uh, I was on the phone with a a financial rep who, um, you know, a a year ago when we were talking about pricing on money, we were at like four point five percent on money. And that was like really expensive to me at the time. And now it's at like uh 0.33% 0.33% for that same money. And so um, if I was going to lend at 0.33%, I'd probably leave my money in the bank and just wait for a good opportunity. But there are people still putting money in the market uh, in a very favorable way. And so I hope that the Treasury doesn't act too soon in adjusting rates and, and sort of uh, get a pushback from the market. And so I think that's going to be important. And then, you know, what's going to happen when the eviction moratorium is over? What type of relief is going to be provided directly to people? There's been some talks about like direct child care payments uh, to uh, individuals. Uh, you know, there was some numbers floated around like 600, 400, 600 a, a month that would go directly to uh, taxpayers. Um, what does does that fourteen hundred dollar stimulus? Does it actually come? When does it come in the next 90 days? Uh, and does is there a continuation of it? Like as as we see uh, the line or the curb not flattening or flattening, does that continue over a period of time where we get to to where some European countries are, where they're actually providing some consistent relief uh, to folks? So I think all of those are questions that obviously are in the back of folks' mind of like how does how do I get the most relief as soon as as soon as possible, and then what does that look like long term from this administration? Awesome. Awesome. Just to piggyback, Malik, uh, Derek mentioned, you know, hopefully not the removal or anything too aggressive uh, from uh, uh, domestic uh, financial policy. Like I would love for Jerome Powell to stay as federal chairman, you know, of the Federal Reserve Bank. Like I think there has been some stability with him. And to me, Jerome has a good or Chairman Powell. Yeah, he has a good grasp <laughs> on on lending rates. Are, are we moving? Um, is this just this needs to be done, or is this a hard shift toward uh, the left, economically speaking? I, I don't think it's going to be a hard shift on the left. I think not, not from an economic perspective, because I think that when it comes to the market, they pretty much take care of that. There are plenty of lobbyists on the Hill to ensure that the federal government does not go too far left or right when it comes to um, 
financial policy. That's just not how it works. I think probably where the biggest um, change, and, I, and I'm not one of those who really, I honestly do not believe there will be these um, huge changes. There will be some shifts here and there um, with some of the focus on the administration as far as um, you know, I know there was a concern about enforcement, civil rights enforcement and, you know, the Office of Civil Rights and things like that. So there'll be some special attention paid to think, you know, to that type of stuff. But I'm just not expecting any type of this really significant change from what Trump is doing, even if you look at some of the things that so he's the police commission that Biden is going to establish on police. I mean, the commission that Biden is going to establish on policing. I think that's a good thing. Trump did the very same thing. He had a very similar commission. Across administrations, um, there's very little huge shift in what happens with the country because, again, the market decides a lot of this. So I think, again, there will be some tinkering here and there. But like Amanda said earlier, and this is something that I think will actually be a realization, particularly for our community, um, people of color, you know, I, I think that we'll begin to understand the, the, the real federal government role in our lives and that it really does matter what happens at your local level. We're, we still don't have a police reform bill. We still don't have a police, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, a, a, yeah, a police reform bill. But at the same time, those things that we really want, like the chokehold bans, the body, you know, mandated body cams, um, all of those things happen at the local level. We don't need to wait on the federal government to do stuff like that. So I think that there will be an attention. I hope that we'll um, pay more attention to what happens at the local level and begin to realize that the expectation that the government is going to come in and save us, that that's not going to happen. No, I I agree. I think it. I don't think this momentous shift that everybody's expecting is is gonna fall on. Uh, I won't say flat, but it's not gonna be what you think. Uh, Attorney Biden Burger, will be nicer. He Biden will be nice. He will be nice. Yeah, all of that. He will not tweet. I, I guarantee <laughs> you, you will get one one a month. Attorney Perkins, last question for you. So, you know, Attorney Perkins, you know, is affluent. She's moved out into the northern suburbs now. Her and her husband, Jared, they've left us. And so now she's, you know, with the up and ups and, you know, the drinking the $10 Starbucks coffee in the morning. So what say you to these economic policies? What needs to happen for us us little commoners here in, in uh, Main State Chicago? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. First of all, let me just say this right now. Um, we make our own coffee at home. OK, we don't spend our money at Starbucks um, unless it's some stock. That's all I'm going to say. Um, so and don't be counting my money. What you doing? Um, all right. That's the other part. So anyway, <laughs> anyway. Um, a couple things I wanted to mention, and then yes, what what do we need to do financially? Um, so what Malik said is absolutely true. Um, we need to be focused on what's going. Whoever Donnell J- James is is just laughing up a storm here. Um, we need to focus on local level policy, right? right? And so, case in point, when he said that there has not been a um, police reform bill, right? What Biden is doing is establishing a police commission, right? What he, it, where he's coming, he's getting together a lot of people from the community, law enforcement, lawyers, and all of that jazz, and putting them together to establish what reform could look like, right? But, um, but to Malik's point, that a lot of that is going to take place at the local level. So here's an example in Illinois. We just passed in the in the in the legislature. We just passed a police reform bill, and it's um, if it hasn't been signed by Pritzker already, I haven't double checked, so don't quote me on this part. But um, it's on his desk at least, where there is a mandate for body cameras. There is um, a reform on you know what you know police um, use of force, right, and how to go about. Um, retribution, if there is a um, use of excessive force and all of these kinds of things. And what does bringing a police officer 
um, train, what does training look like, right? So um, that happened in Illinois. It's extremely intense. It's very detailed. And I am actually very proud to see that that happened already, right? And so we need to see more of that widespread across the country because Malik is right. The federal government can't mandate state and local police to do that, right? We have to do that. So um, absolutely correct, I think. And um, in terms of like a seismic shift with the federal government, yes, I agree that there aren't you know, huge drastic changes that are going to happen at a federal level, because we really do need to understand the dynamic between federal, state and local governments. Um, Federal governments have a they have a specific jurisdiction that they're working with. And this a lot of time is 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 what's happening nationally. Right. But what happens for you day to day, like your parking tickets, your rent, um, amount, um, you know, where you bank and how you vote, all of the stuff that matters from a day to day perspective is happening by your state legislature, right. by your governor, by your mayor, by your city council, right? And so we have to be more and more involved with those kinds of things. And so this is why I was so happy to see folks getting involved in the gubernatorial races that were happening ac- happening across the country or the you know the mayoral races that are happening across the country because that stuff matters all of the time. Um so Biden no Biden I, I don't want to make this misconception, though, that he's just a figurehead because he's not, okay? Right. because he can make policy that affects us, such as what Derek was talking about regarding tax, right? Because even if you don't have state taxes, you do pay, pay federal taxes. And so what Biden and the federal government determines will be your, t- your tax rates um, applies to you, right? Even your student loans, the tax rates on your student loans are applied by the federal government. They're set by the federal government, right? So so I don't wanna make it seem like Biden is a figurehead because he's not, he's so much more than that. But daily policy is coming from your state and local government. Um, What do we need to see from um, an economic standpoint? Frankly, we need to see a revival of our small businesses and we need to invest more in black, brown businesses. We have not seen direct investment the way that we need to see it, right? So for example, this marijuana boom, I haven't really been hearing a lot of talk about it still. Um, Recently, I should say, the fact of the matter is black and brown businesses should be invested in and we need to make a, a, a direct investment for people to be able to participate in this area. What's so funny to me is you'll jail us for use of marijuana, but then when you make it legal, you don't invest in us so that we can get some return on the use of marijuana. Right. Do you know what I mean? So I think we have to be very strategic in how we're investing in our in our black businesses. And let me say this too. We are in an we are in an unusual time where black owned businesses is they're being highlighted all over the place and brands, major brands are taking advantage of this. I can't tell you the number of partnerships that major brands are making with black businesses because it's it's in vogue right now. Black business is in vogue right now. It should not be in vogue. It should be the standard. Okay, and so I want to see more direct investment, not just from our government. I want to see more direct investment from us as well in our black businesses, because, frankly, we have the buying power. Black people have a trillion dollar buying power in this country. Don't tell me we can't invest in our own businesses. Okay, you go and buy an Apple watch. Why don't you go buy Malik watch? Right. So anyway, (laughs) that's all I have to say on that part. I think we need to, we have to be purposeful about how we spend our money and our time. Awesome. Yeah, just a piggyback. Invest in black business. You can start right now. How do you invest in a black business? I'm a black man. I got a YouTube page. Subscribe to the page below. How do you invest in a black business? Support a brother. That's my cash out right there because, look, licensing costs. You know, all this is not free. So, It has been an amazing episode of Politics Today. I want to thank my guest again. I know the Keisha Cole uh, versus Shanti versus battle is starting right now. And I want to give you guys the time that you need to watch this because I'm going to be watching it as well. I want to thank you, Amanda. Where can I connect with you? I always forget to put my contact information up. You can just find me on LinkedIn. (laughs) Amanda R. Mankata Perkins. Um, and also Munkata Perkins, you can find me on Facebook. So I'm easier to find on LinkedIn. That's it. Derek, where can I connect with you? 
Uh, you can connect with me on Instagram, Hope Pusher Twenty Four, or you can find me on Facebook, Derek Scott. Awesome, and Malik, where can they connect with you? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, same spelling of the name, except on Instagram and Twitter, there is an underscore um, behind the L on the app duel. Awesome. Let's get Malik back on Roland Martin because it's not the same. Honestly, it's I love Roland, but it's not the same without you because I like oh, listening I heard. to Greg Carr and <laughs> Kelly Bethea and all them, but after a while, it's like, hey, you go... <laughs> <laughs> Without Malik, it's just, it's, there's no show. I'm not trying to be funny. There's just there's no show. I want to thank my guests again. Look, Monday, I got a special episode. I got some wild people coming on. Surviving cuffing season the Christian way. It's going to be hilarious. You know, I like throwing these lighthearted stuff out there. But until next oh, time. Right. But don't forget, Derek is running, campaigning, right? Can you make right. another plug for him? He's <laughs> campaigning. If you're a member of the Church of God in Christ, listen up, all you Kojics out there. He is running for uh say, say where you running from treasury, National right? Trustee board, trustee, trustee board, trustee board. We need brothers like him. He's honest, he doesn't steal, he loves God, loves his wife. We need brothers like him. Put Derek Scott on the trustee board. He's got my stamp of approval. I'm not a bishop, but I can't give a stamp of approval. <laughs> All right, guys. Until next time. Thanks. Peace.